I'm feeling full of beans. Fun. So, spoilers and warning that this video is mainly talking about things that I disliked, so it will be largely negative. I'm not doing a full in-depth review of Future Redeemed, just talking about how I think it doesn't stack up. Also, I guess spoilers for the entire Xenoblade Chronicles series here, bar X. Want to add that I'm focusing on the negative here because it feels like you can't say anything bad about this game or this DLC. All that I've seen online are just praise. Things like, wow, this is the best DLC, exceeded my expectations, blew me away, the perfect ending to this series, yada yada. And I just don't agree with that. I think some Xeno fans sometimes go a bit overboard with the hype and praise and don't really stop to think about the actual flaws in the games. I get the feelings there, I do, but I wanted to be able to get my thoughts out here too. This video is sort of a response to all of that, and maybe someone can relate to what I'm saying too. I hope I'm at least not the only one thinking these things. Anyways, let's get on with the video. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 was the anticipated third entry in the Xenoblade Chronicles series. My favorite game series. Not my favorite entry. It definitely has problems, but it was a really good one. So I know that I and many others were hyped when we found out that it would be getting the same DLC treatment as Xenoblade Chronicles 2. I mean, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is my favorite game of all time, in large part because of its DLC. So, I had high hopes. Yet, up until this last wave, each wave of DLC was quite underwhelming. The new heroes were not too good, the new challenge mode was closer to Xenoblade 1's than Xenoblade 2's, and was generally regarded as being too easy although the roguelite mode was quite enjoyable. But everybody was holding out for this final DLC, the story expansion. It was supposed to be redemption for the entire DLC package. The cope for all the other waves was that the base game already had a lot of content and things to do. It was already good, so really they didn't need to, or they couldn't do much with the DLC. But Monolith is great at expansion side stories, see Torna and Future Connected, so surely this new one would meet our expectations. And yet, here we are. Well, I've seen a lot of praise for this DLC online. To be honest, to me it seems like a lot of the hype that you would expect, typically you follow the fan service in the game. Like I've seen so many people say that uh, this DLC was perfect, you know, best game of all time, perfect ending to the series, yada yada, but... But really looking at it, I feel like Future Redeemed does not live up to the standards set by the previous DLC and overall cements Xenoblade Chronicles 3 as having the worst DLC slash post-launch content slash extra content of all the free games. I think there's one important thing that I don't see people talk about. Doesn't this game feel a bit unfinished? As someone with a background in game development, it just feels quite obvious. It feels like there's missing content. The most glaring tell is the affinity scenes. I'm not sure what they were thinking with, with these. It seems like they were going for something that's like heart to hearts, but they end up feeling quite awkward. The conversations are nice, but other than voice lines, they're just simply panning shots of the environment. It was clearly meant to be something else here. Either animations of the characters talking, or well, I don't know anything else. To me, this seems like a clear sign of they either ran out of, out of their budget, or ran out of time to make the animations for these scenes. But they had already recorded all the lines, and didn't want them to go to waste, so they simply recorded panning shots of the already existing environment, which is really easy to do, and just slap them in there. It just feels totally unnatural, the execution and the feel of these 
so-called affinity scene. And I sometimes have a hard time making out who was talking because you can't actually see them. Without a face to put to the voice, it can be really hard to tell who was actually speaking. I'm not sure how this is not a bigger standout issue for some people. This does not at all fit to the standards that other games have set with stuff like the heart to hearts. Another thing that stuck out to me was the design of the affinity skills slash charts or whatever they're called. They're pretty long and it makes it seem like the game is going to be longer than, than it is. But actually, if you just wanted to rush this story, you probably only got up to the second level of affinity chart for only some of the characters. To me, it just seems a bit strange and unnatural that you won't really organically reach the strongest or even close to the strongest that you can be before fighting the final boss. And this ties into another thing, which is all the unlockables that make your character better. The art unlocks, chart unlocks, gem unlocks, accessories, you know them all. While I think these are cool concepts and allow you to choose which characters you want to make stronger, the execution is a bit lacking. You can only get these exclusively from exploration or a few specific quests. If all you wanted to do is get through the story, you would scarcely pick up any of these, which subsequently will make the fights really difficult and not impossible. I'm surprised this isn't also an issue for people since with the Torna DLC, people were screaming and complaining that all the side quests were mandatory. Which I suppose is because the game doesn't explicitly tell you that doing side content here is mandatory. To me, it just seems like the devs didn't really know what to do with these unlock kits and decided to just spread them out throughout the world, instead of being deliberately placed in key spots to help the player along the journey, which is something that I would expect of a single player game. Which kind of again kind of leads me towards maybe a bit of a theory that perhaps there was more content planned for this expansion, more things that they wanted you to do that would give you these unlock kits, but they weren't able to do that, and so it, it ended up again just being a uh, exploration. Let's just put them all throughout the world randomly, and the players can find them. And then there's all the missing story beats that would have been expected of the game, especially from what we saw in the trailer before it released, such as How did Rex, Shulk, and Z end up fighting together against Alvis? Oh, that's just hand-waved in an exposition conversation. Also, we're not going to show any more of that fight than what was in the trailer. And same thing with Rex and Shulk's injury, also just explained in a random conversation. What happened to show don't tell? Not to mention the giant question mark of Mithra's child. We know that they exist due to the picture in Nia's room at the end of base Xenofree. Glimmer is obviously Pirate's child, and Mio is Nia's child, so it seems like it would only make sense to show Mithra's child. I'm pretty sure everyone was expecting to see them somewhere, and yet no mention or hint of them at all. It breaks the rule of Chekhov's gun. You can't show that Mephra's kid exists. Show Rex's other kids, but then just skip out on one of them. Maybe they just scrapped them from the game? Couldn't figure out a place to put them in time? I'm not sure, but it definitely feels off, and it feels like we were shown something, we were expecting a reward out of it, which just never came. The beginning of the game also just felt like playing through the trailer. I kept expecting more to pop up, to see something that would blow me away, but no, that didn't happen. It feels like they overall maybe just ran out of time or budget to show us or tell us more. The expansion literally starts with the same way the trailer started, and yet we don't see more of that, you know? How could they not show us the fight between Rex, Shulk, Z, and Alvis? That would have been so cool, so fitting, so hype, and yet it is just glossed over. So 
while all of this is sussy evidence, it's not really anything concrete. But what makes me lean into this conclusion of ran out of time slash money is the timing of it. The trailer for this DLC was just shadow dropped all of a sudden on a random day of the week. No Nintendo Direct or anything like there has been for all the other DLCs. And then announcing that it's coming out only a week later? This has never happened before with any other Xeno title. It gives the impression that Nintendo just wanted to rush this out ASAP. Compare this to the treatment that Xenoblade Chronicles 2 got with its DLC, Porn on the Golden Country. Announcement trailer at Nintendo E3 2018, June 12, 2018. Another trailer hyping it up, July 31st, same year. Story trailer, August 24th, and then released September 14th. It's such a stark contrast. Why has the treatment of Xenoblade regressed since Xenoblade 2? When Xenoblade Chronicles 3 performed even better than it and it was so critically beloved. And also especially considering that Nintendo has been relying on Monolith Soft for so many of the recent titles, like Splatoon and the new Zelda. The theory that I saw that made the most sense was the new Zelda coming out, Tears of the Kingdom which is set to release May 12th, probably already out by the time of this video. Now that game has been pushed back time and time again, and I'm sure Nintendo is desperate for it to succeed. It's gotten attention in almost every Nintendo Direct, I think, for like a year now. So it's possible that Future Redeemed was supposed to come out either during May or June. A lot of fans were expecting the DLC to be re released during the summer, since we heard no news about it for so long, which is also why the announcement was so surprising. If that was the case, Nintendo could have thought that future redeemed releasing would have taken the spotlight away from Zelda, or they just wanted to focus on Zelda for those months. We know that they do like to switch around release dates for these purposes because they've done it before. Prime example being when Splatoon had to be pushed back to September of 2022 because it needed more time, Xenoblade 3, which was originally set to release in September as well, it got pushed up to July of that year. They didn't want two big titles releasing around the same time. Xenoblade 3 was at least ready for release early anyways, but Future Redeemed might not have been so lucky. The fact that we heard little news previously about it, as opposed to Torna, where we got several trailers, suggests it might also have needed more time. Xenoblade also isn't the only game that Suspect here to have gone rushed out. Fire Emblem Engage also had a very speedy DLC release. Four waves of DLC were released in about two months. While I do believe that Engage was already completed long before its release, based on leaks, this speedy DLC release is definitely abnormal. Normally Nintendo likes to spread out DLC releases over several months to keep hype for the game going strong, as well as sales. Yet if Engage had spread out its DLC as normal, it would have fallen right into Zelda's release schedule as well. So this is just another point of evidence that Future Redeemed was likely forced to release early. Now, I'm not super up to date on everything the creators of the game say, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were still saying that the game released just fine, nothing was rushed, it's all complete, etc. But of course they would say this stuff. They wouldn't openly dunk on Nintendo, their publishers, so I don't think that would be anything conclusively shutting down this theory. <laughs> okay, let's talk quickly about the gameplay. I overall liked the gameplay a lot. It felt more fun than the base game, and the exploration I felt was really fun and improved. Being able to track everything so you know when you've reached 100% was really nice. But what kind of sucked about the exploration was that so many gameplay features were locked to it. 
mostly being the unlockables for art, affinity chart, etc. Forcing the player to explore, especially when it's unnatural because you have to go out of your way to find many of these things, I don't believe is very good game design. Because of this, many of the story fights can feel too difficult as well. No matter how well you played, some fights you would just keep losing because you don't meet some stat check or you can't beat them fast enough. So if you weren't going out of your way to get some of these unlocks, the game will feel much more difficult than it should. And on the flip side, you could argue it's maybe too easy once you do have everything. So overall, it's not balanced too well. I also want to mention how weird the survivors stuff is. Like every area has as part of their completion condition to find a certain number of people. Some of the people you find are already dead or dying, which makes sense given the setting. Um, whereas others are people that let you rescue and bring back to Colony 9. What I find strange is how have these rescued people even survived? It breaks my suspension of disbelief a little bit. Like I'm supposed to believe that this child has just sat here for hours or however long it takes you to find them and they're just good or other people out in like phallic mountains who probably should have died from frostbite or not having any food or anything. These are all people that need rescuing so not like they've been out and about on their own providing for, them, for themselves. Um, but yet still you could just find them, be like hey cool, you're saved dude and they just fuck off. I don't know, it's just a weird little detail. I like your attitude, kiddo. So much in this story just feels slapped together and hand waved away. I kept waiting for the moment when everything would be explained, but it just kinda never happened. I'll explain more later when we get to each character, but a lot of the things from the base game were just left unanswered. For example, what's up with the consoles still? Console A is still a big question mark. It was established that there's consoles for all letters of the alphabet, and yet A is the only one that doesn't show up in the main game. We're left to assume they just simply don't exist at the moment. But why? It feels awkward to deliberately create a band of villains based around letters of the alphabet, fill them all out, but just leave one empty with no explanation? Like, it's sloppy in a way. And so, people were expecting to hear some kind of mention of console A in the DLC at least. And yet all we see are repeats of other consoles in the DLC, Q, R, and W, with yet again no mention of A. There have been theories online that Z left out a console A, deliberately because of the character A, who has no relation to the consoles at all, or that console A is supposed to be Alvis, and that Z just didn't want anyone taking the A name after Alvis was defeated, like out of some sort of weird respect. There are several theories and headcanons such as this, but that's all they really are, just theories. The game itself doesn't give any clues or hints towards this besides the fact that A exists, and that Z calls Alvis his god once in a cutscene, which was still cut pitifully short. Then there are consoles X and Y. These were implied to be around since the beginning just as Z, but again, there is no real explanation as to where they came from, what they represent, etc. Even Z is still just as mysterious as he was in the base game. It would have been cool to see how Ionias actually came to be. Like seeing Z, X, and Y forming together. Are these three a representation of the Trinity Processor? Well, I don't know. There's not enough evidence to really form that theory. Although I guess you can't dispute it because there's nothing to prove otherwise either. We are literally just missing so much information. Everything ends up just being left to interpretation. Which, by the way, is something I could bring up as a problem in general with Xenoblade 3. The whole villain of the week feel it kind of has of the consoles. We don't know them. We don't care about them. And yet they're the main villain of the game. 
besides N, of course. We do care about N. Like, it, but it just feels like the other games had so much better villains. And these ones are just kind of thrust into your face and you have to accept it and not ask any questions. Now, let's move on to the fog. Because a big part of this game's exploration are the fog rifts. They're literally a completion requirement. So, can we talk about how these are literally not explained at all? They're just there. The first time one shows up for you, there's not even a cutscene or, or sequence where the characters are like, Whoa, what is this? It's just like, yup, let's go defeat that. If you haven't played Future Connected, you'd have no idea what the fuck is going on here. Though to be honest, you might still not know since they're still not explained too well in that game. Like, I guess we're supposed to just assume the fog rifts are all related to Alpha, and that it's because of Alpha's influence. We know they're not in the base game, so clearly these fog things went away after Alpha's defeat. But still, we don't know how these are connected to Future Connected or Xenoblade 1 either. It seems like they started showing up in Xenoblade 1 way before Origin was a thing. And wasn't the Fog King defeated then? Is the implication that these things were also showing up in Xenoblade 2's world? Why are they here to begin with? Were these Fog Rifts here from the start of Ionios? Or are they only a recent occurrence? Well, I don't know. All we can do is speculate like this, but there's really no answers and I don't think there's any uh, satisfying conclusions here. To me, it kind of feels like they're sort of an excuse for gameplay. You know, the devs wanted to have these in the gameplay. I guess either be a callback to Future Connected, or just to reuse assets from that, or just to have more things to put in the game, so there's sort of more things to, to check off to make it look like a perhaps a bigger thing game than it is. I don't know. And then, of course, there is the ending. It felt like the game was ending too fast. Like, Wait, huh? That's it? Did we just be Alpha? Wait, now A is going? What are they gonna do? And huh, is Shulk and Rex too? Why? What's going on here? Oh, I don't know. It's too bad. Just deal with it, bro. <laughs> I kept thinking surely there would be more. Even when the credits were rolling. Like, I was just waiting. Surely there has to be more to this more things that we haven't seen yet. And while it was cool to see the worlds merging, that's all we really saw at the end. Like, I would've loved to see at least more of the aftermath, what happened after they merged. I want to see Rex, Pyra, Mephra, Neo, Neo, Glimmer, all together as a family, and Mio and Noah find each other again, and just all of that. I feel like we deserve to see that happy resolution at least. You know, after all this time, after all these games. If this really is the end of the Klaus saga, it's kind of a shitty thing to just end on. Oh yeah, and the falling blue thing. I have no idea what it is, or what it means, and yet it seems like the game was trying to hint that it means a lot. I know a lot of Xenosaga fans and Xenoblade X fans have been Supposedly arguing about what it means. Um, well, fun funnily enough, I've never played either of those games. But as a core Xenoblade series fan, it meant nothing to me. And yet, this is supposed to be the future of the series. I understand putting in references and such to the other games, but if the core conclusion that we're supposed to get from this DLC, which is supposed to be the end of this whole series of games, the end of this whole saga, is just an unexplained reference to a past series, you're kind of screwing over or like just not respecting the fans of the actual game series that we're playing right now. So before we get into specific characters, I just wanted to speak generally about them. Why were some characters brought back from the original worlds and not others? Rex, Shulk, Riku, Panacea, and Linga are the characters that were brought back. I guess Nia and Melia count too? But I think in the case of them is that they're like the queens or whatever, so 
maybe they would have always had control of origin and so have gotten into origin in the first place. But I don't know, another thing in the game doesn't really explain too well. Anyways, why these characters and not others? It's implied that everyone else is just within Origin. So only a few people did not join Origin when Aeonius was created. As far as I know, these were just kinda like... LOL, random, Origin didn't feel like it? The secret will of the people allowed them to stay? I don't know why exactly them, but it is unexplained, which I don't really like. They kind of just appear out of nowhere in this game, and we're expected to just accept that. Maybe they think people would just be pogging out too hard about the references to really stop and think harder about it. I suppose Shulk and Rex are the main characters. And Panacea and Linka are the oldest children of the cast members from those games. And Riku is an Oppon representative. So it makes sense from a meta standpoint of the devs just wanted these characters in, but from a lore standpoint, you know, why them specifically? Boy, would I sure love it if I knew how, why, and where these guys came from. They somehow consciously choose to not go into Origin and to instead assimilate into Ionios. Was it a subconscious thing that they wanted to stay there? I don't know. There's also the issue of how old exactly are these guys? It is once again implied that these guys have been here since the start of Origin, but then how old is Origin? At least 80 years going by the age of Gondor. But we know Noah and Mio have been dying over and over, many times over before Gondor was born. So, have Shulgan Gang been here for hundreds, even thousands of years? Wouldn't they have some thoughts about that? I mean, you know, I imagine being alive and being around for so long would have some kind of heavy mental toll on them, and there'd be some kind of more drastic changes we would, we would see. Not to mention Riku, who has surely been around for at least a thousand years since he's still present even in base games you know for you. Do they all really not age with an origin? How is their body working? If their aging process isn't working, what about eating, digesting, sleeping? Do they also not need to do those stuff? if their state within when they got an origin is preserved. Except we see that they do those things, like eating and sleeping, so... Yeah, I guess it's quite strange how some body functions work, but some don't. Future Redeemed also brings up the character of Enabit and gives some more information about him. Which is mostly great, but then there's the whole thing of the sword. It's revealed that N has a version of Lucky 7 that looks like it has a Logos core crystal. And we all know that Logos is Malos from Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And we previously haven't seen any mention or reference to them at all in this game. We then also see that the next Lucky 7, that the Noah we know eventually gets, is involved with the core of Numa. What? How exactly? How does this all work? Where did they, the swords, really come from? What does it all mean? You know, they say it's made of origin metal, but where did they get the origin metal? Is it just some reference, or are Pyra Mephra really involved in some way with Noah's Lucky Seven, for example? How did N get their sword? Of course, none of this is explained at all. You just gotta accept it, I guess. My problem here with these gaps is that it is so unusual for the series. Xenoblade 1 and Xenoblade 2 both had really satisfying endings with DLCs, with maybe an exception for Future Connected, but we'll get to that later. There were very little, if not no loose ends. Some things to speculate about, but still, they felt complete. Xenoblade 3 though, alongside its DLC, still just feels incomplete. 
we're not getting the whole picture here for whatever reason. Maybe we were spoiled by the other games, but it shouldn't be unreasonable to expect the same level of quality a third time around. Maybe someone might say, surely they can't answer all these questions, but they've opened this can of worms themselves. I agree it's difficult to answer, but then why even attempt to make such a story? Like there's a reason why writers typically stay away from time travel stories, because it runs into a lot of, a lot of the same issues of how to keep consistency and details making sense. Point is, I've never walked away from a Xenoblade game feeling so confused and wanting answers so badly. And yet, we don't even know if there will be another Xenoblade game. Supposedly, they're going to be moving on from now. I think Takahashi said that Free would be the last Xenoblade game. Although I have no specific quote on this, just uh, trust me bro. <laughs> so, this feels like a real sour end. I'll show him a thing or three. Nice. Rex is cool. He was one of my favorite characters in Xeno 2, and I think he steals the show in this game. The amount of sheer badassery and coolness he brings is unmatched. Unfortunately, he also brings a lot of questions. Okay, so I already discussed this a bit before, but I will say again how it sucks that they just tell us how Rex got his eye injury instead of showing us. Same thing with how Rex got here. We see a little bit of the before with the battle against Alvis, and then just straight cut to the present day, I guess. It's a bit disappointing. Now there's also Rex's swords. They are obviously Pyra and Mephra's swords, which can sometimes combine to Numa's swords. But how does that work? Pyra and Mephra aren't here. We don't know where they are. So why can Rex just use them whenever he wants? and combine them to Numa swords when, whenever he wants. Why does Rex's, and by extension Shulk's too, weapons just work the same as the blades in this world? For the new kids, I understand. That's how Origin slash Mobius made it. And the citizens modeled their weapon system after it too. But Pyra and Mephra's swords were not part of Origin. So shouldn't they work the same as they did in Xeno 2? Granted, it was pretty similar to how it is in Xeno Free anyways, but this is a larger issue for someone like Shulk who, I believe, previously had to sheath his sword physically like a normal weapon. It could not just disappear into nothingness and then be called back whenever he wanted. And yet, in Future Redeemed, that's what he can do. That then brings up other questions, such as, is this the same without a Rex as Future Connected? Is it a new one that he got? that he made while he was here. I know this is Rex's section, but I mean, technically all these questions could apply to Rex too. Point being is I just don't quite get the logic here. There's also the fact that the game seems to want to shy away from making any explicit references or callbacks to the other games, which is a bit hypocritical considering Rex and Shulk are already here. They're literally fan service and direct references to the previous games. For example, at the end of the graffiti quest, Rex finds this old relic and it's clearly some kind of Xeno 2 reference. He's all like, oh, it's something I'd found when I was just a kid. A certain king asked me, see? But then they just don't say what it is, or even who they're referring to there, or explain anything further. I mean, even I, who am a huge Xeno 2 fan, couldn't really tell what was going on there. Like, there's being cryptic, and then there's this. What's the point of these references if they're so subtle? You're okay with some blatant ones, but not others? Is this game supposed to be fan service or not? I hate this attitude of wink wink nudge nudge, I'm not gonna explain this, but surely you at home can tell what's going on, right? Sometimes I just can't. I kinda do just need it spelled out for me. And maybe that's a skill issue, but I'm sure I'm not the only one, and I don't see why Rex could have just said outright what was going on there anyways. 
I'm not sure what that whole quest implies anyways. Who from Rex's past could have possibly left in that string of notes if everyone else from that game was put into origin? This whole cheeky way of dealing with these references applies to all of the characters, by the way. Okay, now talking about Rex's actual role in, in the story. Looking aside from the coolness factor of him, Rex is fine for the most part. There are only some moments when it's confusing on why he acts the way he does. For example, being so restrictive regarding Glimmer. Rex in Xeno 2 was always a very free spirit, so it didn't seem too much like him. But considering Glimmer is actually his daughter, I suppose it makes sense, you know, that he would be a bit more protective. There were also several times where I was screaming at the game, why doesn't he just tell her? Tell her that, <laughs> you know, the whole parent-daughter connection. Although I'm not too upset about it now, um, I have read some posts online saying that it wouldn't really make sense anyways because Glimmer wouldn't understand, which... Yeah, I kind of agree with. That makes sense. Glimmer wouldn't really know the concept of parents and children, and she wouldn't really know the significance of it anyways. And she probably wouldn't even care, but it still feels like a huge wasted opportunity to not have that moment that I think everyone was waiting for. Most welcome! Silk faces a lot of the same problems as Rex. I just wish to have seen the whole process of how he got here, to this point. You know, from Future Connected all the way to when Origin became a thing and Origin activated. Although I do enjoy how kind of laid back and easygoing he is, especially regarding his son. It does seem very in character. But I also just don't like all the vagueness he has around like all the old references around the world. Because the DLC is actually mostly Xenoblade 1 references. You'd think Shulk would have more to say about them. Especially, you know, all the recurring uh, scenery, environments, and all that. But he barely even mentions his past teammates. Also, Dunban is fucking dead, apparently. His new Monado also seems to be basically just a normal sword. I mean, it can hit humans for sure. Although I actually don't remember quite the lore exactly on the Monado Rex. I know Shulk made it after he lost the first Monado, but I don't remember the exact properties of it. But also, as I mentioned with Rex, it might not even be the exact same weapon he's using here. Also, I just wish Shulk was stronger in game to reflect his own lore. I mean, they made Rex crazy. Shulk is kind of, kind of just a sad tank in this game, though. Someone's got to put you in your place. They're okay, but another case of I just wish that there was more there. Like, why these two? Are they just the oldest kids from Origin and so that's why they didn't get assimilated and join the cycle? Although to be fair, they don't seem older than 20, which 20 would be the cutoff for the program it seems, unless the only people that get, did get an Origin and that have been reincarnated were only those were exactly 10 years old when uh, Origin started, but then were there really that many 10 year olds in the world? I mean, maybe considering both of the worlds together, but you, know, you would have thought it would take ev everyone within that range of 10 to 20. Anyways, I think Charlotte's kid slash Pandoria's kid felt a bit strange. Like, okay, cool, but not exactly what we wanted or were expecting though. I mean, Charlotte and Pandora are kind of basically side characters in their main games. I wish they would have properly confirmed the father's though. I mean, I know we can assume, but still, it'd be nice to have those direct references. Anyways, for characters that should be so important lore-wise, they seem quite regular and plain in the game. They're not even heroes that we can use. Once again, I just wish you could have seen them more, maybe even, again, used them, or at least had them as 7th party member heroes. Perhaps even see their reactions more to what Shulk and Rex did. Or maybe they did show their reactions, but they're just kind of in the background like they always are. Also, what kind of names are Panacea and Linka? Common variety Nopon. How, when, where, and why. 
they just casually put Riku in here without explaining anything. Well, they did sort of explain in one throwaway line where Riku says that his master pawn is Melia, which implies that Riku is from pre-origin like Rex and Shulk and the others. Um, but that's all we get really. Why this one not pawn? How has he survived for so long? Especially considering, again, he's still around in the base Xenoblade free game. Surely he must have some thoughts about being alive for literally thousands of years, longer than anyone else we know in the game aside from Stay. I don't know, Z himself? But you know, that also raises the question of where do Nopons themselves even come from? They don't reincarnate, surely. Are they just living normally in this world? Just going about and populating the world as they normally do? Like, they're not in the reincarnation multiple copy cycle, are they? But then where did, did the first Nopon come from? I'm not sure why no one has thought of this. Like, no one seems to find Riku's existence strange in this game's world. So also, is it just normal for Nopon to live that long? Or has Riku just traveled a lot, enough so that nobody remembers him from the past? I don't know, the whole existence of Nopons is very strange. It has been from the beginning, but in this in particular, you know, I kind of wonder why Ionios would even decide to allow Nopon in. <laughs> you know, I mean, it makes sense that Nopon should have been copied into Origin, right? I mean, there are people too. Um, Ideally, people that society would want to preserve. Um, but considering that a lot of people did not show up in Ionia, so they're just trapped in Origin, I imagine most Nopon are still trapped in Origin. The, the Nopon we see, you know, where are they? Are they like, they can't be deployed in the military and used as Mobius fodder, so surely they're not in, they're not in the reincarnation process. But then, one of them, or a few of them, would have had to somehow get into Ionius in some way in order to make multiple copies of themselves, repopulate, roam the world, yada yada. I don't know, man, just a, a weird thing to think about. I must be some kind of genius. Don't got much to say here. He is full of beans. He's an alright protagonist. I mean, we, we, lo we love our himbo men here. Can't have Matthew showing me up. Why is she not playable? Clearly, it's possible because we could play as her in that one cutscene. Like, do they think it would be too broken? As if they're really concerned about that when Rex exists. Is it just to fit some lame rule about heroes in the game? You know, heroes can't be playable, they're just extra characters. But, like, she's the only one, so there's no real harm in just having them as an exception. I just, I, I want to play as my Welsh cackle now anyways other than that Niall has other problems too they're just well not that great of a character i mean i love their design but they don't make too much sense why is she so obsessed with children slash orphanages like to an unhealthy degree i guess she's just so passionate about it which is okay but it feels like there should be something deeper there. Her motivations and anger just seem a bit whack and not too justified. I mean, her stance is one that we've seen a lot in the base game of Xenoblade Free, the whole, you know, let's not get involved kind of thing. But her mind break moment seems a bit too much out of character. I mean, she literally kills, murders even, that whole Kavesi squad when she's supposed to be this kind and gentle person i mean her character kind of makes sense i guess i just wish there was some more nuance there instead of just extremes but i suppose that extreme emotion is what alpha was looking for so without that there wouldn't be a game and you know i guess nael is the first person in hundreds of years who had that kind of strong emotion i mean i don't know phenomenal it is cool but what even are they are they non-binary or not? I don't think it was ever explicitly stated. I suppose they were implied to be, but they're also seemingly female presenting as well. Um, especially considering they mention Alvis having a masculine and feminine side. 
they really just appear out of nowhere and be like, I, I'm gonna help out this dumb himbo man, <laughs> Matthew. I honestly don't get the semantics too much of how they exist and what it all means, but I mean, it's all cool consider considering all the rest of the plot holes and contrivances. You know, A is sort of the least of our worries, you know. A is the thing that makes the most sense among all the things that don't make sense. Nice going, smartass. She, she is cool, but again, there's not really much there. I have heard a lot of people complain about her voice acting, though. Which I do find strange, because I did enjoy her. Huzzah! Alright, finally last character. Well, he's not much of a character, but I guess he's cute. Again, if he's, he's a supposed founding member, it's supposed to be important. I feel like his doesn't really do much. But then again, you could say that about most characters. You know, pretty much the whole main cast didn't really have time to sort of grow or become real characters aside from maybe Matthew and A. All their plot holes I didn't have time to really get into or explain. The ageist kids not inheriting the powers of their mothers. For the sake of the plot, this makes sense. But is it supposed to be this way? Is it only because of origin? Like, would a Glimmer's core crystal really just be pure aesthetic? The ending implies that a fully realized Trinity processor was capable of beating Z up whenever they felt like, since Z doesn't actually have the full backing of Origin. But I don't know, I guess A, Rex, and Shulk just wanted to sit back for, the, for a while for the whole rest of the game. The overall world of Ionios is way less compelling than what we get in 1 and 2. It blatantly disregards many established rules of this, those series because of some handmade excuse like, oh, we're just some fake computer world mishmash, that's just how it is, Obius changed some things too. And yet it also wants to explicitly include those games with all the references. If the Ouroboros team we see in Future Connected was good enough to take down Alpha, why couldn't they take down Z? We should be weaker than Alpha. Sure, they lost Rex and Shulk and A at the end, but they might be able to just make up for that with a little training. Or, you know, those three could decide to actually help from the inside. I don't know. Humo is also implied to kind of be there and helping, showing up near the end with Matthew's new fist of the end. So why could they have not helped more? And where the hell is Logos? Could they have not helped more? The future. So this DLC was kind of described by Takahashi himself, I believe, I don't know the exact quote or source on this, so don't quote me too hard, but uh, something that would wrap up the game series as a whole and tell us about the future of the series. But well, I have no idea what the future is. If this is it, then I find that quite alarming. There's clearly more to be said here. So if this is the end, then that would be quite an unsatisfying conclusion. I would have thought Takahashi would want to avoid that, especially with how Xenogears and Xenosaga had to end. So I don't want to believe that he was really limited and had to end things early a third time. I guess we will see if there will be a Xenoblade 4, but I find it kind of unlikely, since there are also interviews and sources claiming and hinting that the next game will likely be a new IP. The Klaus saga, as they say, is supposed to be over though. It's sad because it feels like they're just throwing away these beautifully baked concepts and characters of the other games for these newer concepts which don't really stack up in comparison and kind of make the whole thing fall apart a bit. This a game I feel has so many plot holes and hand-waved conveniences, I really would have expected more out of a Xeno game. Like, we cannot end things without seeing everyone's kids and families. We know they exist. Like, that's what I was waiting for, honestly, as the credits rolled. I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels dissatisfied here. Even gameplay-wise, while I did enjoy it, 
it felt unfinished and not very well balanced. Tank suck, Rex pulls too much aggro, Matthew is perhaps not good enough as he should be to compete. But the healers are good and fun though. Honestly, the biggest offense here is just Mephwest Kid, where are they? Like you legit, you cannot tease us with Mia's Kid and then Pyrus Kid and then you showed that they all exist, right? And you're just missing one. That like that's it, it's it's very clearly intentional, right? You know, if Mephwest Kid wasn't important, you know, why even have them exist? Why show a picture of Mephwest having a child, a baby, if they're not gonna come back later? Again, literally break, breaking the rule of Chekhov's gun. Or, as I will say now, the rule of Mifra's kid. Okay, please. If you're gonna show Mifra's kid exists, you have to show us, you have to show them actually existing in use, growing up, the family, being together. Okay, we know their family. Kind of, but I want to see the dy dynamic there. Rex, Pyra, Mifra, and Nia, do they all live together? You know, are they happy? How does that work? What's their routines? I don't know, but this is something I really want to know, and that they sort of, they tease us a bit with that, right? But, I don't know, man. So, I realized my main point for this video is that Xenoblade 3 has the worst DLC. I think it should be quite obvious why I think Xeno 2 has a better package. It has more quests that are also more interesting. More additional characters who are also stronger and more interesting, a better challenge mode, and a better story expansion. Their story expansion actually did tie up any loose ends from the main game and had a very strong, emotionally resonant story. And I don't care about the mandatory side quests because I like doing them anyways and they're not really too long or hard to do. Now, I know Future Connected isn't exactly a DLC. OG Xenoblade was released at a time when DLCs weren't really a thing. However, with it being an addition to Definitive Edition, we could call it downloadable content. It's just free. Future Connected was pretty short, but it was a fun time. It didn't have too much substance, but it still made sense and didn't exactly contradict anything from the base game. It was just a nice extension of the base game. It gave us more of what we wanted and the characters that we enjoyed. The ending did leave a little to be desired. All the Fog King stuff, you couldn't tell really where that was going. It seemed like they were definitely leaving that to be explained in the next game. That did suck, which is why I would rank it below Xenoblade 2, but still higher than Xenoblade 3 in terms of extra content. It was at least unpaid after all. Okay, so I kind of ran out of steam a bit here. There's potentially more I wanted to talk about, but my brain's been going a bit fuzzy and I figure it just turned into pedantic ranting eventually. This is my first scripted essay type video after all, so forgive me if it's a bit short and, I don't know, rambly, not hitting the points in the, in the, in the best way. But still, thank you so much for watching and please subscribe for more videos and follow my Twitch if you want to watch me vibe. I stream at least four days a week doing all sorts of stuff. I covered my main points though. I do like this game, but I feel like it could have been so much better, especially with all the hype and expectations of being the final Xenoblade main series Klaus Saga thing. And I'm quite disappointed on the execution here. Also the end screen is boring as fuck, what the fuck, literally fucking 0 out of 10 worst game of all time. Ah!